Hey everybody, thanks for attending this event here with us. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, I guess the word pioneer gets used a lot, thrown around a lot. Um, sometimes it's applicable, sometimes maybe less applicable. In this case, uh, it certainly is very, very applicable. Um, we have with us tonight, as our special lecture guest, somebody who really revolutionized the art of DJing, um, revolutionized club life in New York City, and by extension, the world. So won't you please welcome Nikki Ciano. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. OK. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Do you think that um, when you hear somebody DJing, you see some, a window into their personality? Would you say that's the case? Wow. It depends. It really depends. I always tell people that, you know, what I learned over the years is to step out of the way when I'm DJing. It's like that first thought that comes into your head, that's inspiration. Everything else is ego. So if people are playing from their inspiration, I think you can get a glimpse of their soul. If they are playing from their ego, if they're playing from the second thought, the third thought, and how would they like it if, you know, yeah. fuck them. You have to like it. You have to like it. Your music has to move you. If your music isn't moving you, it's not going to move anyone else. You know, don't go there thinking, oh, I'm, I got to impress or, oh, the dance floor is empty. I got to make them dance. No. Go with what you're feeling. The first thought, play that record. So um, if they're playing from that inspiration, yeah, I think you, could, you can get a good idea of who they are. So if we were to listen to Nicky Ciano DJing in, say, 1972, what, what was a window into that personality? What would, what would that be? I was an excitement junkie. Um, Kenny Carpenter used to say that I would peak the crowd longer than any other DJ because um, when I got them to a point where they were just screaming and yelling, I wanted more. And uh, since they were on acid, it was pretty easy to get them to go a little bit longer in that kind of vein of, you know, I, I swear, uh, uh, Frankie talks about it in my film, turn this motherfucker out. That, that's a chant. That they, the first time they did that chant was at the gallery during Love is the Message and, uh, in 1973. And... Um, it's become, you know, a dance floor chant. And that's the way the people at the gallery used to party. Another thing in the film, if you haven't seen it, Love is a Message, the film. <laughs> um, turn the beat around. They would sing along. People would sing along with the music. And um, I would be able to turn off the sound. And they would sing perfectly in time. They would clap to the beat and sing the words. And um, it was a pretty special experience back then because it was the first time people were doing that freestyle dancing. It was the first time we were hearing that kind of music, that R&B music that just talked to you. It was the, you know, the Vietnam War had ended basically from protests from the citizens. We felt empowered, you know, the tramps were screaming, love epidemic, spread it around the world. And it was, you know, everyone knew the words to every song. It was really about um, the words taking people beyond just what they were doing at the moment. The words were catching into a spiritual vibe. You know, if you say, I love you, I love you, I love you, love yourself, love yourself, over and over, it becomes a reality. And so the words, everyone, a thousand people in a room singing those words, it just made it a reality. And uh, it was, you know, the, the, the room was vibrating with that energy. Well, I mean, DJing and DJs as we know them today didn't necessarily exist uh, back in the day when you started. So what sort of catapulted you into trying to become a DJ, you know, as we know it now, a club DJ? What was your inspiration? 
there were several DJs who, Michael Capello was one of the DJs that I heard, and I said, wow, he's a great DJ. But it wasn't until I went to the loft in 1969, I was all of 14 years old, and uh, a friend of my brother's, and at the time, David always invited in, you know, young people. Always opened the door to David young Mancuso. People. Yeah. David Mancuso of the loft. And um, I went into the room, and he was behind the window over there, and I was dancing with my girlfriend Robin, and we we're dancing and dancing, and all of a sudden there was a peak. The bright white lights went on, and every light went off except, say, that little lamp. And we're still dancing, and I'm going, wow, this is really cool. And then there was another peak, and that lamp faded out. It just dimmed out. And I said, he controls the little fucking lamp in the corner. I want to do that. That's total control. I, and, and it wasn't about so much as playing records. It was about creating atmosphere and creating um, a kind of feeling within the room. And, and that was really important to us. You know, people get, I get very lost in lighting sometimes when it's done well. But what's happened today is people have flooded the dance floor with lights. Back then, it was one light at a time, one effect at a time, so it had much more impact when that mirrored ball went out and it turned into a red wash on the on the walls you notice because it was the only effect in the room or the color spot went on or the fog went on or the smoke went on whatever happened it had more impact when it was one thing at a time rather than what you're seeing today. It was like eight or 10 or 16 things. When one light changes, you don't notice it because everything else is still going bing, 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 bing in your face. Well, uh, just to back up a little bit further, um, how did you actually learn about places like the Loft and the other clubs that you initially went to? You grew up in Brooklyn, right? What part of Brooklyn did you grow up in? Sheepshead Bay. And um, went to uh, Lincoln High School. And um, I started going out. Well, OK, I started going to the village because I heard that gay people congregated in the village, in the West Village. And I went down there and. Um, a few times, and then one night I went down there, and there were people blocking the um, the traffic on Sixth Avenue and blocking the traffic on Seventh Avenue, and that was the weekend of the Stonewall riots. And if you people don't know about the Stonewall riots, there was a law in New York that two people of the same sex could not dance together on a dance floor that if they had a liquor license and two people of the same sex danced together, they could, cops could come in, close the place down, and take away your liquor license, too. Um, so there was this law going on, and this club, the Stonewall Inn, constantly was busted. Like every six weeks, they would come in, they go, you're dancing together, we're closing you down for the night. Well, this weekend night, Judy Garland had died that week, and the, the village was very crowded with gay men and women. And when the Stonewall was raided, there were a lot of people outside and inside who were just fed up with the bullshit. And one person threw a garbage can, and there were only two cops at that first, inter you know, the first interceded with just two cops. And um, people just went crazy. The cops had to lock themselves in the bar, call for backup, and they couldn't control the uh, response because it was thousands of people with all this pent up feelings. So I was down there for that. And then I met this chick in high school, Robin, and I said, you gotta come down to the village. And, and she said, well, we're having a good time, but isn't there some place to do something like dance? And we started asking around. And the only place we could go, because we were 15 or 14 at the time. Actually, I started going down when I was 13. We were 14. And the only place we could go was this place called um, the Firehouse, which was run by the Legal Defense League. 
and um, it was a firehouse on Worcester Street. You used to walk down below Houston. There were no lights. There were no people. There was nothing but muggings. And it was dangerous. It was da New York was a dangerous place back then. Um, so we would walk down there, you know, get to the firehouse, usually a few people outside, and we would go in the firehouse, and then I heard this music. I remember um, You're the One by Little Sister, this song. It was, it's by Sly Stone. Sly Stone produced it. And um, I remember thinking, this music is just it for me. I'm really digging what it's doing to my feet. It's making them move. And this is before the drugs, you know? I'm just, they made, it made me want to move. So I started getting into, I got to, what's that record? You know, what's that record? Where can I get them? And I remember there was this specific record called Rain by Dorothy Morrison. And it was hard to get. And I couldn't sleep until I had that fucking record. And I went from record store to record store to record store. There was, there was no calling back then, or you didn't even know the name of the record stores because you had to walk around and physically see the record stores. You know, I didn't know the name of so many records. I didn't know the name. I was 14. Other people knew the name. And finally, I found Colony Records, which was on Broadway. Still there. One of the, no? When did it? Pretty recently, a couple yeah, of years ago. A couple of years. It had to be because I was there recently, a couple of years ago. Okay, goodbye. Another New York <laughs> legendary so, sorry. place. Bye. Goodbye, Second Avenue Deli. Goodbye. Soon, oh my God, what is it going to be like? Anyway, so uh, we. I start. I found Colony Records, and they had Rain by Dorothy Morrison, and I realized here's the place to go. And I was at a party. My brother had just moved into an apartment, and I'm at a party, and all these straight people are not. Those well, straight people are, you know, much cooler today than they were in 1969 in Brooklyn, New York. I mean, yeah, like, no, Brooklyn is a very cool place now. It wasn't always that way. It was not a cool place. And these people were behind. I'm talking about, like, you went into Manhattan. It was a different country. It was really different back then. Brooklyn was, whoa. You didn't want to be caught dead in Brooklyn. So anyway, I go to my brother's party, and these people are all, like, getting drunk or whatever, smoking weed back then. And the music is, and Robin's going, put on some of your records, put on some of your records. So I start putting on the records. And we're getting up and dancing. And this chick comes out of my brother's bedroom and says, hi, I'm your brother's new girlfriend, Dale. You like this music? I'm taking you to a place that you're going to love called The Loft. And that's how I got to The Loft. And then Robin and I just couldn't. I mean, I, I kept getting beat up in Brooklyn, you know? I don't know if it was the shorts, the corkies, you know, the six-inch corkies we used to have back then. It was ridiculous. And uh, rhinestone pins, and I was a New Yorker. Yeah. So uh, I, we moved into Manhattan just like two kids selling a few quaaludes and having part-time jobs. And we move into Manhattan, into the village, um, the village something hotel on Washington Place, and Village Plaza. And believe me, it wasn't the plaza; it was a dump. Seventy dollars a week. Roaches were included. <laughs> it was it was a dump, and it was a tiny little room. And the two of us would just huddle there and go. Why did we move out of our parents' house? Because they live in Brooklyn. And we were able to go out like every night. And we found this other club called The Limelight. The Limelight, you had to be 18. But by then, we were already like 16. And we were passing. You know, We were getting into the clubs. And Robin had a couple of few jobs that she doesn't like me to mention, so I won't say. Um, but anyway, so Robin had a few 
jobs, and she was bringing in some money, and we moved around the corner from the loft on Bleecker Street between Broadway and Mercer, and the gallery winds up on Mercer Street, which is outrageous. That was my first apartment, $280 a month, a one-bedroom, and we would go to the loft every Saturday night, and then during the week, we would go club hopping. And we wound up one night at this place called The Round Table, and Robin became friends with the manager. And we used to go in every night and complain about the DJ. And he didn't like the DJ either, the guy. And we, oh, this guy, he didn't even know Rain by Dorothy Morrison. That bitch doesn't even have it. What is he kidding me? Everyone's playing it. They're playing it at the limelight. They're playing it at the loft. This guy doesn't have it. What the fuck is wrong with him? He fires the DJ and hires me. So my first job, six, um, no, it was, yeah, I was, I was 16 years old, it was February, 1972. I was just about to turn 17 in March, and I started working there, and I turned 17 while I was there. I just wanted to make it to my 18th birthday at a, at a thing, because then I was legal and I can go other places, but I didn't quite make it. I made it to November, and then I had a fight with the drag queens. They had a big drag show there, the La Flore sisters. And uh, they thought they were the shit, especially the John LaFleur. And he would look up at you and expect you to know that he needed the record to change when he looked and went like that. And that meant change the record to, uh, you know, it was a, a medley of Supremes hits, you know, Love Child and all that old shit. And anyway, so he looked at me and I didn't change it because I, didn't see his look. I was doing something. I was getting his next record out. And he came up, had a big fight with me, and I got fired that night. And Robin and I started walking around, actually right here on 22nd Street between 6th and 7th Avenue and saw a loft. Every place had a placard that said, loft for rent, loft for rent. And we went in and we said, how much is this loft? He says, it's 5,300 square feet and it's $360 a month. Yeah, that's right. 22nd Street, between 6th and 7th Avenue, $360 a month for a loft, 5,300 square feet. Ah, that sounded good to us. So we go to my brother, we make up this business plan. My brother has just settled an accident, and he got insurance money, $10,000. He put that into the, we went, we hired the best sound man we knew, Alex Rosner, because he was on every sound system you saw in New York at the time, the limelight, even the loft, Alex Rosner Incorporated. And we hired him, and he said, okay, your sound system's gonna be $6,500. That left us 3,500 to put down a floor, to put down tiling, to build a separate dance floor. Well, we didn't get to it all at the beginning. We got to the wooden dance floor and the rest, we just left it, masonite, you know? And we opened up to what we called a straight version of the loft. That was February. Didn't work, 100 people every Saturday night. This was 1973, the beginning of three. So um, February, March, I guess I turned 18, and that June, David closed for the summer. He was taking all his staff there, and we went out and handed cards out outside the loft that night and said, what are you doing this summer? Come to the gallery. And the next week, there were 500 people at the gallery, and that started the gallery. Um, but what really moved the gallery to the legendary status, although that space on 22nd Street, you know, it was Calvin Klein, it was Willie Ware, it was every designer ever came to that club. And it was really, Larry LeVan used to work for me and so did Frankie Knuckles. They used to actually blow up my balloons, believe it or not. Um, and became really good friends with both of them, especially Larry. He lived with me for a very long time in the beginning before he decided to be a DJ himself. 
Um, and Larry would was into fashion. That's what he did. And he would create these cap sleeve T-shirts. And he would have he would draw them out, and then this guy who sewed would put them together. And uh, he would wear them like for two or three weeks. And within two months, you went to Capizio and you saw a rack of cap sleeve T-shirts there by the Capizio designers who were at the club all the time. It was just like that, you know, and it was that quick back then. Um, so it was really a, a, a watering hole. We got closed down in the summer that everybody got closed down, 1974, and we moved downtown around the corner from the loft to Mercer and Houston. And that's when I built what people call the first disco because, first of all, disco was not a word yet. People didn't say disco. They said, we're going to the club, we're going to the party, we're going out dancing. Disco was not a word in, in the vocabulary yet. It just wasn't going around yet. Um, and I have a problem with the word to this day because I feel like the record companies created that word to label things and sell them and kill it, basically, and that's what they did. Um, so anyway, I built this, I designed this like trapeze with the lighting on the trapeze and the lighting went up. It was very high ceilings, about 36 feet and the lighting went up in three tiers. So it looked like the lighting was moving into the ceiling and it was a, a, a balcony and it was, it was very futuristic kind of thing. And Steve Rebell, who I worked for at his first club, the Enchanted Gardens used to come there every Saturday night and he would sit under the DJ booth and I connected my DJ booth, I connected the counter to two beams so it never touched the floor and I didn't have any feedback. So it just went from beam to beam so you had to go underneath it to come in. And he used to sit under the DJ booth and look up at the lighting which moved into the ceiling and then he opened studio in 77 with everything that went up into the ceiling. It took him a couple of years, but he got there. And that's how it was back then. You know, it was, you know, it was everybody taking ideas from everybody else, but taking it one step further, or some people take it one step back. Right. Um, I, ahead, a Jim. couple things, um, just to, as a point of reference, um, just when you just mentioned, you know, your relationship with the term disco, I think Let's play something that sort of gives people a, um, an example of some of the things that inspired you. You mentioned Dorothy Morrison, so let's listen to Rain for a little bit. Hey! 
I said to Jeff, you know, can we move it forward so we can hey, hear that last like crescendo, the last breakdown? Because he said it's only two minutes and forty three seconds. We'll just play the whole <laughs> fucking thing. And that's uh, boy, you talk about work. Yeah. DJing was working back then. And nothing was longer than four minutes in 1973. I mean, nothing. And you were changing those records like frisbees. <laughs> you had to have some coordination. Um, I, wanted, I want to ask you this, because I've always wondered this, um, before we get to the gallery stuff in depth. But yourself, Francis Grasso, Steve DeCisto, Michael Capello, David Mancuso, all of these pioneering New York City DJs. David Rodriguez, Bobby DJ, well, before, Good well, Bobby, but um, Italian Americans. Right, right. Good Adaro, Bobby Good Adaro. Right, Bobby, was, right. Yeah, he was Italian American too. Why do you think that is? Because the mafia owned all the fucking clubs. <laughs> and they were more comfortable hiring Italian goombas <laughs> than anyone else, period. End of story. You know what I mean? That's a matter of convenience, but I mean, was there any, I mean, was there any other experience that was shared between, I mean, because you guys all could have been DJs, but no, not, it have, been, really not was, have been innovators. It, it you know? was that way. It was, they were more comfortable, you know, hiring an Italian. They felt like they can talk to them than anyone else. And it was, you know, there was a lot of prejudice still going on, very, Prejudice, New York, um, in '72. You know, and uh, even you know, it, it was hard for gay people. You know, I, I mean, now it's you know, people grow up and they think uh, gay marriage, oh, it'll happen, and this and that. Gay marriage, we we didn't, we couldn't even hold hands. Forget about it. You couldn't say you were gay in some situations. It was bad back. then. When did you come to the realization about your own sexuality? Very young. I, I, I think that, I really think you're born with the orientation. Um, I was very young and I started looking. But I love women too. I, you know, I love to dress them up, do their hair. <laughs> That's my friend Al. <laughs> and go out dancing with them. <laughs> um, I've had my share of relationships with women, and um, it's complicated. Mm -hmm. My life is complicated. But as you're saying, like you, your plan was to to open the gallery as a so-called straight version of, of the, the loft, loft. Right. Um, and what it became was not a straight version necessarily. How no. would you how would you describe what it became, and why is it why is nightlife especially in this era, why was it so important for young gay people um, in New York mm. City? The disenfranchised, that's what it was about. The nightlife became a place where the disenfranchised gathered and supported each other in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, it was really hard for, you know, uh, Hispanic, black people, every disenfranchised group was in the club at one point or another. And the thing about the gallery was that it didn't matter, gay, straight, black, white, Asian, it didn't matter. You were accepted 100% and you were never, you know, there was never a fight. There was one fight in seven years that we operated, one fight. What happened? A guy lost his, we lost his coat. So the, the coat man said, I don't know what to do, man, but we'll, we'll work something out. And the guy just punched him in the face. I mean, he didn't even wait. We were going to pay him for the coat, you know? It was just, just punched him, you know? Uh, he was doing the wrong drugs that night. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, and now, you know, I went to, uh, well, I'm not going to even mention it, but anyway, yeah, there were there were no fights. It was it was about community. People really felt like they weren't just going to a club; they were going to their club. This yeah. is my club because it was private membership too. 
the gallery was private membership. You couldn't get in without a membership or being a guest of a member. But it wasn't hard to get a membership. You just needed to be recommended by a member. And then you got a membership. It was that, it was that simple. Um, but it, it sort of was a good out when you saw someone that you said, are you a member? No, you're not a member. I remember the night that David Bowie and um, Mick Jagger came, and the famous door person, Robin, who was my girlfriend, she's looking down at the, the thing, and she says, membership. Uh, member number, yeah, membership, please. Uh, John Addison sent, I don't care who sent you, no membership, you can't get in. And the bouncer clocked her and said, look up, bitch. And she looked up and she said, oh, David Bowie, Mick Jagger, please. <laughs> Step right in. They had a really good time, too. They stayed the whole night until we closed. It was amazing. You, um, you mentioned the sound system at the gallery and Alex Rosner. Um, gallery is known for a number of different technical innovations. Bass horns. Right. I, I had the first crossover ever built was built for me. Um, I had the first Bozak mixer. Um, we had the first... Um, equalization um, done room-wise with pink noise. You know, people weren't doing that back then. They were just doing that in theaters, making the room flat with equalization. They weren't doing that in clubs. So uh, that was the first time. The three turntables, of course. Um, I used to do things with the tape. I used to create an echo with the tape loop. Um, I just, you know, Whatever, if I dreamed it, I tried to make it happen. And I, I would dream things and just, I mean, you're all in the business in some form or another. You know what inspiration feels like. And when you get an, an idea in your head and a light bulb goes off, you try to make it happen, you know? You do what you can. Mm -hmm. And controlling the environment. As I you controlled, I controlled right. the fan, the air conditioning, every light in the room. Um, so it was it was crazy because I used to um, like really peak the crowd, and then I would. When you throw a bright, we had what we called a white flash, and it was it was eight white four hundred watt bulbs, so it lit up the place like a Christmas tree. And then we send people into darkness, you know, like on that last thing, it was like on the cymbal crash, and then darkness. Like in Girl, You Need to Change Your Mind, very famous for that part. And when they went into darkness, I would turn the fan on overhead, and you would feel like a draft, and people would just scream, you know, it was just too much for them to, to, to handle, to keep their mouths shut, you know? It was, so it was, yeah, controlling a bunch of the different sensory um, inputs. Now, in the first version of the gallery, you had sort of a walls built around the dance floor? Yeah, we built, um, at the beginning, it was just one open space because we couldn't afford to do anything. And, and uh, more than anything, I wanted to enclose the dance floor into a separate room. And basically, that was for two things, sound and lighting. Um, when you have a separate room, you can control every light. I don't, uh, when I go into a club and the lights go and then everything goes into darkness and there's the Schlitz sign or the Budweiser sign blinking in my face, it doesn't do it for me, you know? I like it. To, if you're going to send me into darkness, I want it to be in total darkness. And when there's a wall around the sound, it makes, first of all, you could use less sound. And when you have corners, you have reflected sound, which is really increases dp dB by 10 dB. Um, so you get just a better sound from a, a closer... Um, 
enclosed area. Musically, what, what did you find people were really responding to? I guess in different, I guess it's in different eras of the gallery, people responded to different things, but you know, you mentioned uh, obviously Dorothy Morrison, you mentioned Eddie Kendricks and, and songs like that, but you know, you put this uh, compilation out a few years ago yeah. of some of the early gallery songs, and you know, it's not disco, or what people would interpret as disco. No, it's, it's, it's very earthy, raw, soul music. R&B, it was called. Yeah. It was called R&B, before disco, dance-orientated R&B was, was what we called it. And, um, you know, like I said, there was no really disco. That word wasn't really out there. And the love I lost. And love is a message. I remember the day I got that record. There was only two of us in New York that got the record, me and David Rodriguez. And um, I played it eight times that weekend. It was just, you know, when you... It was like a radio station, what a radio station does. I was dealing with the same group of people every Saturday night. So I would program them. I remember the night that Love Hangover came out. I played it eight times. And then at the end of the night, it played to the end and everyone was screaming. I picked up the needle, I only had one copy. I picked up the needle and put it on right from the beginning again, right from the very beginning. And it just, People were ready for that. You know, that's what was going on back then. DJs were stars. I mean, I remember when Gallery closed for those few months when we moved, I, I went to another club called The Window Paint. We, the next week, 500 people. Um, people followed DJs back then. That's the way it was. And um, it was because, you know, we were good. Larry... I mean, people would follow him to the, you know, to the ends of the earth. Yeah, we were good. <laughs> what do you, um, what do you think Larry learned from you the most? Um, obviously, la the cult of Larry. Drama. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, obviously, the Larry's legend continues to grow. You know, even posthumously. What, um, what do you think he learned from you? Uh, you obviously mentored him as well. I think I think the main thing, and Larry took it to the nth degree, was the appreciation of sound. I thought, if you're going to dance, the sound system should be the most important thing in the room. It should, you're going to listen to music, you're going to dance. Today, that has totally gone out the window. So we were constantly tweaking and making the sound system better. If we heard about something new, we'd have Rosna bring it over, test it out, see how it sounded in the room. And Larry, he, he got together with Richard Long, and Richard Long started building him speakers, and those speakers became legendary. I mean, the Bertha, that's the Levan horn, you know? Um, it's... And it's still in a lot of clubs. They still make the Berthas. Um, but today, they don't make... Ca it's like sound men had cabinet makers, and they were made one-off. You know, cabinets were built custom. The first bass horns ever built were built for my club, and they were scaled-up, low-end clip horns that were just made bigger, corner horns that just gave that low-end... Like, mm, not pop, 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 but mm, you know, it was folded, folded horns. Front loaded horns are going to give you that pop, but this was a chambered horn that was baffled and it gave a much. First of all, it went down. I, we measured in Coney Island, we still have two of Richard Long's J horns, they go down to 24 hertz. You know, function one goes down to 50, that's it. These go down to 24. Humans can't hear below 20. It's, it's something, it's really something. So um, yeah, it's easier to build something that goes down to 50, because you don't need a cabinet that's as tall as this room. You know, the J-horns are that as tall, and they have to, the, the 
you know, the, the speakers sit all the way up in the speaker, and then they're baffle, 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 and then they come out the scoop at the bottom. So you have to have that room. And the berthers, what they did was they used the corner of the whole room as part of the speaker, and that's what gave you the response. So, um, you know, people were willing to go that extra mile, build a wall here because these speakers are rated to be 24 feet apart. This is rated at 12, and that's rated at 12. So if they're closer than that, then we're going to get cancellation. We need them exactly 24 feet. Let's build a wall. And people were willing to do that. Today, it's like, no, we have to invest more money in the bar. It's got to glow. I don't get it. I, don't, I just don't get it. I don't understand it. But people see the difference. I mean, when they come out and they hear me and I, I do a, a, a thing, it's different. One of the other things Larry was known for was, and you were known for, um, was being able to tell a story through the songs. Did you have, do you have like a favorite sort of sequence of, of songs because of their lyrics that you put together to express something? You know, the song Love is a Message, I mean, the fact that I was the first one to play it, I named my movie Love is a Message, and it's, it really was back then a lot of messages about love. Either it was, I love you, baby, I want to live with you forever, or I love you, but I don't love you anymore, get the fuck out. It's either one or the other. And those messages were pretty much what we relied on back then. Um, you want to talk about Grace Jones? Do you want to talk about Grace Jones? Sure. It's a story, <laughs> right? You want a story? Grace Jones' story is always a what, what is your favorite Grace Jones story? Well, when I met her, I mean, she was, first of all, she was not signed to Island yet. She was, the, her managers had put out two songs, That's the Trouble and Sorry, which are both on her first album. And... Um, they had put that out on a 12-inch, and they were passing it around, but no one was playing it. And Michael Gomes, who still does lights for Francois on Monday night at Cielo, um, he came to me and he said, you got to meet this Grace Jones. She is a trip. So we go to the manager's house, but before we go there, we have to get lit. We smoke angel dust, right? Now, I don't know if you guys know about angel dust, but it's like a trip and then some. <laughs> so um, we're up there, and we're like loop-de-loop, -loop, and I'm like really sick. I'm going all out on the balcony and throwing up over the balcony. Oh, it was terrible. We were terrible. So Grace comes in, and she's got the regalia going on. You know, she's got the full hat thing. Hello, darling. I'm Grace. And she sits down next to me, and she sings both songs, beginning to end, to me. And I said, honey, this Saturday night's our ha Halloween show. You got to come and sing. She said, of course, darling. And whatever you're on, I want some. She was signed that weekend. Right. The guy from Ireland was there at the gallery, and she was signed that week. Some of the other memorable, memorable performances. Um, Lolita, Lolita Holloway. Holloway. The first, Lolita Holloway had her first album out, and it was, you know, it was just burning up the dance floors, hit and run and dreaming. The remix was not out yet, but we were playing it off the album, and it was just wow, you know. Um, and they called me up and they said, look, Lolita's in town. If you want, we could bring it to the gallery, you know, next month. Um, we were giving our February 14th St. Valentine's Day Massacre. This is my brother's idea. So you know where the Italian comes in here. The St. Valentine's Day Massacre. And they're standing around with uh, machine guns and black suits. Oh, please. So anyway... She comes in, Lolita, 
And um, she's up on the stage, and I haven't announced her yet, but she's up on the stage, and Love in C Minor by Sarone was playing. And she's going. So I turn up the mic, and she's scatting to Love in C Minor. Yeah, 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 yeah. The place fucking, it was like 1,300 people there. So we're packed in like this, erupted. I played that tape for two years until someone stole it. And uh, I'll never forget that night, she was supposed to do two songs, she did five. And um, it turned me on to the song, We're, Getting Lo We're Growing Stronger the Longer We Stay Together. I mean, that song to this day still is so meaningful to me. And, you know, it was easier to tell stories back then because the songs had words and meaningful words and in-depth words. There's this song called This World by, uh, it, it was done by the Staple Singers and also by Sweet Inspirations, which is the better version. And it says, um, he, my mind holds this, he holds my mind in his hand, and it's, there's just such deep meaning in the words back then. You could tell people really thought about the words to the songs, and they really meaningful. Love and happiness, you know, makes you want to do right, makes you want to do wrong, makes you come out early, makes you stay out all night long. I mean, it's simple, but still, today, you know, um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's a different. You can call me on. A, you can call me on. A, okay. So. <laughs> Drake, right? Yes. Let's talk. Does anyone know the song that's sampled in the Drake song? Why can't we live together? Why can't we live together? Right. Why can't we live together? By Timmy Thomas. A great old song, Drake speeded it up from 106 to 120. And that's the whole track of his track. And um, it's a great song in and of itself, Why Can't We Live Together. But so many songs, I play Think by Lynn Collins. It takes two to make a thing go right. Every time it comes to that part, everyone knows that part because of a rap song. But it's, you know, it's an old club record. Well, I mean, it's just a different era of craftsmanship in terms of songwriting. These people came up through, you know, different different experiences and yeah. different disciplines. Let's just listen to a little bit of We're Getting Stronger since you mentioned it. Yeah, sure. <laughs>
was live. It wasn't a machine. get chills from the, just the words. I mean, it's so constructed so well. And Lolita could sing, baby. That Rain song, by the way, you know, it, it was danceable. It was gospel, but that's what it was, you know, that's the category it was in when it came out. And we played a lot of gospel, a lot of rock, too. We played a lot of rock. And I don't get this, you know, one type of music, stick to it all night long. It's boring. You know, I'd much rather hear an eclectic mix of things. It works for me to move the night along. Yeah. Um, it, it just the one beat, 128 all night long. Bah, bah, bah. Oh, please give me a break. Give me a break, someone, please. Give me something at 110, something at 106. There are funky things down there. Right. A lot of funk happening down there. I mean, Even in new records, I hear it all the time. I mean, if you're back then also, playing a set requires playing not an hour, not two hours, no. several hours. Well, I for you, started at yeah. midnight, and I ended at 8.39. So you're going to have to go through some ebbs. You're going to have to be on drugs is what you're going to have. <laughs> well, didn't want to say that, but yeah. <laughs> Why did the gallery close? Um, bad management. Uh, that's all I could say is bad management because um, there was no lack of... This movie was shot the last couple of weeks and you see the place is packed. Um, Actually explain, because this is, this is your documentary film. And it was shot at the gallery in 1976 and 77. It was... Several people from the Tisch University, the film university, came down. They said, we want to do a documentary here. And they shot all the footage, but it never came out. So about 10 years ago, I got the footage back and digitized it. And we put this movie out about two years ago. And if nothing else, the visuals are just incredible because it's actually that year. You go outside Houston Street and you see it like empty with the old Chevrolets and the old cars and, you know, Houston Street empty. I'm talking about not a person, not a car, nothing. Sunday morning, nothing. It's pretty stark. It's, it's jolting. And um, I love this film. It's uh, and Frankie... Frankie's last full-length interview. Frankie Knuckles. Yeah. What um? Do you have any regrets about how things ended with the club? Yeah, I do. I, I think that if I would have taken the bull by the horns and said, no, we can't close it. We have to do this, this, and this. But I was so frustrated from, you know, when you're working with a manager who you bump heads with, it's very difficult for a creative person to keep being creative. Because as soon as you get 10 no's, you turn away and you start going other places. You just don't want to hear a no anymore. You know, you just forget about it. I'm not going to even ask. Um, 
Then I went to Bunny Milk Bottom for, for four years, and they were much more receptive to everything, and that was great, too. Another thing that I left because I had dreams of reopening the gallery, and it didn't work out. So, You also did um, a tenure at Studio 54. I played... I was the first DJ, along with Richie Kazar, at Studio 54. We were hired by Steve Rebell before the club opened. I played the second night. Richie played the first night, opening night. I played there for the first three to four months. I played for the Bianca Jagga birthday party where she rides in on the white horse and everything. Um, but again, you know, I was into this DJ star, and one night... I completely let the record end and brought in Trans Europe Express from the very first tick, 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 tick. and I saw Stevie, he was on the he was on the balcony and he was with Richie and he got up and said, This song, what is this song? I was fired that night. <laughs> so I blame Trans Europe Express for that. Now, at the same time, though, um, what did you feel like after you got, after you left Studio 54, after Buttermilk Bottom, you went to a little bit of a dark period. What was that experience no, like for you? I think that Buttermilk Bottom was the dark period. So, so what think, was the dark period? I, the dark period was my heroin addiction. I was addicted to heroin, and back then it was stronger than it is now. And uh, it just, it took hold of me. I mean, it just, it just was more important than playing records, which I didn't think anything would be more important than playing records in my life. And when that happened, it came out in my work, and... Uh, I had to stop working. I had to not go into clubs because I was still going to the garage and it just someone would hand me something and I'd take it, you know. I had to stop all of that in order to get sober and um, to start living again, you know. What was, what was the low point that made you turn things around? Um, I think I had, I had just lost everything. I didn't have an apartment. I didn't, and I slept on the subway one night and I went home to my parents' house and they said, we'll take you in, but you've got to go get help and we'll tell you where to go. It's around the corner at Coney Island Hospital. And, um. I did. I went. And that experience worked for a little while, but really what got me sober and kept me sober were the rooms of, uh, uh, you know, a 12 step program. And you turned your life around to help others. I, David Rodriguez, who was a DJ friend of mine, was um, one of the first people I knew who died of AIDS in 1984, who I knew personally. And um, at that time, I, was, I had been sober for about two years, and um, I was very involved in this thing called the Healing Circle, which was for people with AIDS. It was about you know meditation and trying to work through positive affirmation. It was Louise Hay, You Can Heal Your Life, stuff and um and i called up a friend of mine who was working at a drug place a drug counseling place and i said you know why don't you let me bring a healing circle there and she said ah, a little too progressive for uh samaritan whatever it's called and uh but you should be a counselor we have a position open and i didn't have a job then so i went up and i interviewed and they hired me and then the next thing i know they're giving me all the HIV patients because no one else wanted them. And then I became the HIV coordinator. Then I went back to school and got my degree in social work. And then I wrote a book called No Time to Wait, which a lot of people were helped by it. It was like how to 
what alternatives to take before the medications are out. It came out in 93, and a lot of people to this day say, you saved my life with that book. And that, for me, was the most important work I did in my life. And um, it was... Um, I was also paying back some shitty karma that I had amassed during the um, disco years. And then I was hanging out in Virginia, working at the Tidewater AIDS Treatment Center. And I was meditating every day, as I was taught to do. And a voice said to me, quit your job. And I was like, I'm so burnt out, but I can't quit my job. And the voice said, quit your job. And I, on just sheer faith, I went in and quit my job. One week later, Francois called me from Body and Soul, and they said, we're celebrating Larry's birthday in four weeks, and we'd like you to play. And that started me playing again in 1996. And uh, I've been playing again ever since. How did it feel to get back behind the turntables and play music at that point? It was exciting, but I really, it took me a while to find my footing again. I really had to, um, you know, I really had to experiment with new stuff, old stuff, and just experiment a lot until I found my, my footing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you continue to DJ, obviously. Yeah. To this day. The 31st, my birthday at Output in the Panther Room, if you want to calm down. Now, what? March 31st. Okay, March 31st. Now, you also have been doing, for those of you who are familiar with some of Nikki's more recent gigs, gigs at the Coney Island. Yeah, at the El Dorado Disco Bumper Cars. Explain what that is for those who okay. may not be familiar. In Coney Island, there's this disco bumper cars ride. And the thing about it is that Richard Long, who built the sound system at Studio 54 and the Paradise Garage and a lot, just hundreds of clubs from 1975 to uh, 1987, um, he built that sound system, and it's still there. Even after Hurricane Sandy, the sound man came in and put everything back together just as it was. And um, it has the most incredible sound system. So I went in there on my hands and knees, cleaned that motherfucking place of all that <laughs> black dust that was everywhere from that fucking ride. And, and we gave parties there. We gave two parties, and both of them were just out of sight, just great parties. Are you going to continue to do more there? I don't know. I don't know what tomorrow brings. I have to, you know, a day at a time, as they say. You know, I wrote a pilot for a, a, a TV series based on my experiences in my life. Me, Larry, and Frankie, the three amigos, building the disco scene. And um, I sort of... I've been shopping it around, and uh, everyone's been saying, but vinyl's coming out. Well, vinyl's coming out. Well, vinyl's out now. We all know it's whatever it is. I don't even know what it is, because it doesn't look like New York in the 70s, because I was there, and it didn't look like that. It did not look like that. Um, anyway, um, so vinyl happened, and maybe we'll get some more traction at this point with the, with the script. It's a great pilot. So you started, you started in this game. You were a teenager. You are now a teenager. You're now a teenager, a more mature and seasoned teenager. Um, how does it feel to have made this journey that still continues? But uh, what is your perspective now? Oh, I'm so worried about the world and the shape it's in. I mean, I really am very concerned about I see people having children, and I just go, how, what's going to happen in 40 years, you know? What kind of world is that child going to be living in? I'm concerned. I'm scared to death. But weren't those concerns, you know, similar in the 70s yeah. as well? I yeah, mean, they we were. Energy they were. crisis, yeah, you know, there was, going into the Cold War, yeah, all these other things. Yeah, there were a lot of things that are similar, similar feelings. But back then, we had a whole bucket of hope. 
And today, it's just little by little that hope, you know, Obama was my big hope, you know, my hope guy, and boy, it didn't work out, you know? Um, and I don't know, Bernie's another light of hope, and I, that's not gonna work out, I don't think, I don't know what's gonna happen, <laughs> I can't, I'm gonna be gone, so you all can deal with it. <laughs> God bless you. Um, speaking of you all, I'm wondering if anybody has any questions for Nikki at this point. Anybody with a, a question for Nikki, if you do, I think we might have a microphone that's circulating the room. Hi, thanks Hi. so much, that was really fun. Thank um, you. So I was talking to the gentleman from the Paradise Garage and one of them was telling me how he used to um, you know, do the acid punch and, and like they would just, he was the guy that ran giving everybody the acid punch, and you kind of mentioned that also. Um, there's a lot of back and forth about how drugs change clubs and how important the drugs are or not to like how people are acting in the club or how, how you know, the experience is. How do you feel things have changed since you started? Like, do you think that the drugs change people's experience of the music? Do you think that one era of that was better than the other, or does it really not matter that much in the end. Hmm. Um, do the drugs matter? Yes, they matter. Um, do they change the experience? Uh-huh. Um, but you can get a real fire going even with the sober, dead sober crowd. I mean, we did LeBain, this is my manager, Rebecca, we did LeBain um, a couple of weeks ago um, Valentine's Day, and it was just so off the hook sweet. And it was, people were basically sober, besides alcohol, you know, and that could be a real mess. <laughs> um, but, you know, that was it, was, it was great. It was a great night. The energy was amazing. So I think you can get there no matter what drug you have or don't have. If you're good at what you do, um, and again, inspiration is that first thought, it, it, it really can cut through anything. Back when there was uh, the gallery and the loft and everything like that, there was, was there no alcohol sold in we all of those clubs, right? Yeah, we didn't have alcohol. We didn't have a liquor license. But people did bring alcohol and drink, but that was very rare. People basically went to see the dealer. We had a dealer, he's in the movie. He would just, he had everything. He had little pockets of everything. No matter what you wanted, up, down, sideways, he had it all. And uh, it was cheap. I mean, 50 cents, for t 50 cents each, two for a dollar, I mean, come on. You know, so people just did that. The dealer got rich and we had to close the club. That's a common story. <laughs> I have one more question, but then I'm sure other people have questions. But what were your, what was your parents' reaction when you moved out of the house with your friend when you were, at, were at so 16 young? years yeah. old? Yeah, um, they. You know, it was different back then. It was so different. My parents were not put off by me going to the city at 13 years old. They, you go, you going with your friends? You gonna be with someone? Okay, fine. It was a different world. It was not so fearful as we are now. We're fed this fear, and I don't even know if it's true or not sometimes, you know? But we're fed this thing like, oh, the kids, I mean, uh, they don't go out anymore, like, alone. It's just, really weird so it was a different world back then and my parents i was 16 my father was basically yeah he's 16 you know he's 16. <laughs> i don't know what that meant thank you thank you who else has a question did you have your hand up back yeah. there um, so you mentioned that uh, you guys were the first ones to bring in about three turntables, I guess? Yeah, um, I was the first one to bring in. 
first one. My third turntable, yeah. No one had three turntables, but go ahead. But so what was the kind of process of mixing with three turntables? Okay, this was what I did it for. I had a dream that I was playing Girl, You Need to Change Your Mind, which was one of the biggest songs, and I was going into Love is a Message, which was the other big, big song, and while I was making the mix, I was playing a sound effect of a jet plane. And that's what I used it for. So, and I did it a lot. I mean, I constant, I had different sound effects that I played during mixes constantly during the night. And I would always, the third turntable had a sound effects album on it. And that's what I used it for. That was my thing. And so also, uh, when did beat matching kind of come into play? Okay, this is another story. Um, at, when I started playing, first of all, the first job I had at the round table didn't have headphones, didn't have a cue system. So I was up on the balcony next to one of the big speakers and I had to put on the other record just kind of low behind and try to feel if it was going to work or not. And then I would just sort of, it was called the blend, not a mix, the blend. And everything was the blend and it was timing. You know, you put it on, put it on, put it on, and then that was fading, and then turn it up. So that's what happened. And then I got the idea that if we held the record, and back then it was belt-driven, so you had to hold it very gingerly, and if you held the record, you can get a better blend. And then I started hearing people sometimes mixing things, and they actually matched. And then I said, well, what if it went the whole night with things matched? Boy, did I create a monster. And I started doing that. I started matching every record, and that became beat matching. Now, you've also said that you would place the 45s on top of the albums. Yeah, did you, did underneath. You, on the 45s underneath the album, so the album would slip more readily. Oh, okay. So it wouldn't hit the um, the rubber platter. Okay, so I used I that as a felt map, like a 45 would be like the felt. Okay, I see. I thought that you would put the 45 the reverse way. On top, no. Yeah, okay, all right. Because that's, no, like, that's like the old school hip hop way where you would glue the 45 to the, to the, to the album, but that makes complete sense. Who else has a question? How's it going? No, no, no. Wait. You <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, when I hear stories like this, it can really make uh, seem a lot of the parties I go to seem very tame in comparison. Uh, what would you say some of the like social and legal issues are affecting the scene in the city now? And what would you say to people trying to foster a community in these situations? It's not happening in Manhattan. It's happening in Brooklyn, Williamsburg, and um, that other neighborhood. <laughs> Old timers, um, yeah, it's it's not happening in Manhattan anymore. And the the thing, well, Giuliani, it's Giuliani ruined the club scene in New York. He basically, by the time he got out of office, he closed every good club in Manhattan. So yeah, it's too hard in Manhattan right now. But in Brooklyn, there's a lot of good things happening. Do you think that there's a path forward with uh, cabaret laws in place currently? You know, it's really difficult. I don't know. If I was, if I had a little space, I would go back to the basics. What I did was make it just people I knew have, if I don't know them, then a friend, they have to be a friend of a friend. And it's my house, I'm having a party, get out, cops. Because you can have a party in your house anytime you want to. Um, you have to deal with neighbors sometimes, but in parts of Brooklyn, if you're in a neighborhood that doesn't have many neighbors, you can do that. And that's what they're doing. They're giving guerrilla parties all over Brooklyn um, in Williamsburg. And it's, it's a new age of an old idea. I mean, you also mentioned, like, you know, outcast societies and communities. Right, right. I mean, do we have outcast communities to the same degree that we did then? 
No, we don't. But we still have people who want to go out to a good experience while they're dancing to music and something that's fun. You know, you want to have fun. It's, you know, it's the one place I feel like you can transcend your troubles. You can tap into an energy that's beyond the bullshit of day-to-day -day life. You know, you can forget about paying your bills for eight hours. You know, it really is a kind of, you know, escape. How did you inspire Frankie? What did he learn from you? <sighs> Frankie splintered off very quickly because he went to Chicago very early on, like 76. But one thing that I'll tell you about Frankie, he was the most kind, lovable person. And you know what, Rebecca? It's what I learned from him. I mean, he was tolerant. He was never the diva. He was always had a smile on his face. Even when they were chopping off his fucking leg because of diabetes, he kept it together and laughed with people and went to dinner and looked in your eyes and talked to you like you were a human being. And I'll tell you, if I could be a little more like Frankie, I think it would make me a better person. Larry, that's another story. <laughs> Larry was much more like I was. Diva. Anybody else with a question? Anyone else? Um, you've talked a lot about DJing. Um, I'm just wondering a little bit about the Dinosaur Kiss Me Again song. Oh, OK. Um, two things. Can we listen to a bit of it? And also, can you maybe tell us a bit about the track and how it came about? And sure. The process? OK. Um, I um a little background I guess for those who may not be familiar with it. Want to put so it on? No, no, no. You no. <laughs> yeah, just, uh, yeah. I was I was working one night and my best friend Lewis always came to the club. They came with the group, and he was there with a friend of his. Had long hair, not really good skin, bad skin, <laughs> and he danced the worst dancer I ever saw in my life. I mean, Spasticus was written about him. Um, and that was Arthur Russell. And um, I'll never forget it. I mean, uh, Turn, Turn the Beat Around was a new record. Wasn't on the radio yet, wasn't happening anywhere yet. And I was playing it, and he came into the booth and he said, wow, this record is really cool. Lewis brought him into the booth. He said, this record is really, really cool. I said, it's new, it's gonna be a big, big hit. And he said to me, you know, we can make a record like this really for not too much money. $12,000 later of my money, <laughs> we had Kiss Me Again, which um, <laughs> we had the drummer from Turn the Beat Around. Please be quiet. We had the drummer from Turn the Beat Around. We had... Um, David Byrne on guitar because he lived upstairs from Arthur and he wanted Arthur to play with the Talking Heads. So David came in and laid down a track. We had Miriam Valley, uh, Desmond Child and Rouge was a big performing act back then. She was part of the Rouge band. And it was a lot of good people. William, Wilbur Bascom on bass. Um, we had like some of the top studio musicians and um, and Arthur wrote a really incredible um, symphony. But Arthur was never finished with a record. And back then, you're dealing with tape. So you only have so many tracks, 24 tracks. And uh, unless you're in a 48-track studio, we couldn't afford that. I don't even think they had it when we started with Kiss Me Again, 76. Um, so he had, like, if the horn was playing in one part, and then he had a keyboard part, but it was where the horn wasn't playing, he would put that all on the same track. So you had a track with horns, keyboards, and um, lead guitars, lead uh, fills. 
So it was like a crossword puzzle gone wrong. Um, it was just really hard to map out. And he would keep recording and recording and recording because he always had an idea. But at some point, you had to say, it's done. And that's why every one of his partners, like Steve DeQuisto took, is it all over my face, out of his hands. Larry didn't even have him at the record, at the session where he mixed, is it all over my face. Um, it was, you know, he had to be let go from the project at a point. Was he brilliant? Yes, he was brilliant. He was a brilliant, brilliant musician and wrote some incredible, I mean, go bang, is it all over my face, kiss me again. I mean, just those three and that's, that's a lot. Let's listen. Arthur on cello. play a different mix now. That was, that was, that was in, but it's, it's the same. Yeah, this is, is this the one you're talking about? I think so. No, it's the same. No, no. It's, yeah. the, it's the A side, yeah. It's the A side. This was the side that became the hit.
Um, it's, it's 13 minutes long. <laughs> I think that warrants a little bit of yeah. applause. Yeah. Yeah. I was I was the first DJ to actually produce a record. Um, DJs were mixing, but they hadn't produced anything, so that was the first time uh, a DJ produced a record. And um, I was actually holding her hand while she was singing. So at some point, I'm like squeezing. Wait, what do you want to do now? And I squeezed <laughs> her hand. It was like, it was something. It was, it was a great time. Did you have ambitions to do more production? I, we did. We did. We, our deal got picked up. We sold 200,000 copies of this. Um, and uh, most disco records were selling a million but back then. But the 200,000 was a lot. And our deal got picked up, and then Arthur just, he did his thing. I want to do this, I want to do that. And they gave us like $20,000. He went through it like that. I never saw a penny of it. I didn't recoup my money. I had, it was all my money that was funding the project. So I just walked away. I said, look, I can't work with you <laughs> anymore. And he d we did a song with... Um, you did one more song together, yeah. though. So that yeah. was the oh, Felix Oh, we did record. Tiger Stripes. Yeah. So what was the story behind that, then? Tiger Stripes? Um, I wanted to do another record, and the, you know, I knew Arthur, and we decided to team up again. <laughs> do you have uh, fond memories of that particular record? or Yeah, because you know? that, that record, I knew what to do with him. Yeah, I said... Get out. <laughs> I'm taking over. <laughs> and your vocals are on that record as well. I did some vocals on that record, but the best mix of that is You Can't Hold Me. It's so good. Which one? Because I actually have you can't I think hold I have me. the right mix this time. Yeah. Which one is it that You Can't Hold Me is the name of it. Well it's which version of You Can't Hold Me? Um no, there's uh, yeah, You Can't Hold Me Down. No, it should extended. be the longer version. The longer. Yeah, extended one. All right, so let's listen to a little bit of this because this is also you and, and Arthur Russell. Yeah. You can really hear uh, author's influence. Five million things happening at once. <laughs> um, I don't know if you've ever heard the original version of Is It All Over My Face, the male, the male version, but it's like 24 tracks full on, everything going at once, and Larry took it and he just stripped it down to nothing and it became such a hit. Um, but the original was, I played the original when it first came out, but. Larry's Virgin just hit it right on the mark. So um, you did some more production. You ran your own label as well. Yeah. Um, DJing versus production. I mean, is DJing really pretty much still your, your heart? Or? I love DJing. I love the live response in the room. 
at that time. You know, production can be long and tedious, but DJing is so in the moment. I love it. I love DJing. Does anyone else have a question for Nikki before we wrap? So you, <laughs> so you DJed in the 70s and then you're DJing again now. What do you think the biggest difference is um, technologically, socially, um, just anything and the differences that you're seeing today versus back then? It was really interesting. Um, you know, I have this arc, like when I first started playing in 96 again, it was like starting all over again. Like I had this audience, but it was all splintered and it was here and there. And it, it just took like about 10 years to like build my audience back up. And now when I go and do a night, it's a very similar experience to the energy that I had back then. Because I'm the same DJ. I'm creating the same kind of atmosphere in my music that I created back then. So it's kind of really similar. The technology, well, what could I say? I mean, it's like you, you can do anything you want. I mean, it's just amazing. And I use it because I love technology. Even back then, I invented a lot of that stuff. And every time a new thing came out, I tried it out. Um, so I love technology. I think it's a great thing. If someone had, oh, you had your hand up. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Um, so um, I had a question about um, kind of the LGBT influence in music. Um, so, you know, I think that dance music owes a lot of debt to, um, you know, LGBT folks that were making music. Absolutely. Right. Um, so I'm curious to know, like, what your um, opinion is on how kind of, like, queer sonics maybe play a role in new music and maybe where that's going now. And if, if, you, if you think that there is such a thing as a queer sound. Oh, I have, I, you know, I have this thing where I call that, you know, that's... <laughs> All fag dance music, I have one one category. And, um, you know, this was, back then, too, it was like, I had this underground kind of sound, and then there was this whole other white, gay, the saint sound, or right above the gallery, flamingo sound, and it was a different thing. It was, I call it high energy fag music, that's what I called it high energy fag music, because it never came down from that thing. But I think gay people are so creative. I mean, we lost so many people, because I was in the trenches when AIDS started, and we lost so many great people during that time. And it, it's, it's really a shame, but we're building back up, and I think we're coming back into our own creatively. And I think gay people are just amazing creators of everything, fashion, um, you know, uh, music, everything. Yeah. They move into a neighborhood and boom, the prices go up. <laughs> everything goes up. What does that tell you? I think there's definitely a place for a, a queer sound. Anybody else with a question for Nikki? Hey, thank you all for coming out. Really appreciate it. Do you have, you have one more question over here? Okay. Okay. Um, is there a sound or a community of sounds coming out in New York City currently that make you feel like you're 18 again? <laughs> um, hmm. The most fun I have is when I play. I'm just dancing in the booth. Um, and I, I love Mobile Mondays. I, I, I go there, um, and but I haven't found something that really kicks my ass since Body and Soul stopped. Body and Soul was the last thing that I used to go every week to it, and it really was fantastic, kicking my ass every week. And they really. You know, they discovered so many records and really made them happen there. And you look forward to hearing flowers and, you know, you can't hold, um, uh, you don't even know me. And, um, 
you know, um, Kenny Bobian records and um, I Shall Be Released. And it just brought in this whole new vein of house music. And I was just Rescue Me and Jamiroquai and all that shit was just so vibrant and so great at, at a, another Richard Long sound system that was taken apart from vinyl and body and soul. And that was the last party I felt really had that old school influence that worked on a weekly basis. Now, 718 Sessions, hit and miss, um, mostly hit. Danny's a great DJ, and that for me is a party that I could go to every time they have a party. Um, um, I used to hang out sometimes at Cielo on Monday nights, but now I, I would rather go to Mobile Mondays. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, do you have any f a final thought? I mean, you know, in a, a room full of creative, creative people, a final thought you want to share with these guys before they send them off? First of all, don't... If you have to compromise, try not to compromise too much. If you feel... Un if you're compromising to the point where you feel uncomfortable about the product, then you got to let it go and just not... Just let it go and do something else. Because... If you're compromising to the point where you don't feel good about the product, you're going to ultimately try to run from it or be there but not be present, like take drugs or stuff like that. You don't want to... Music is something you want to feel good when you're doing because it's creative and you have to feel good about your work. And you're very very blessed if you're making money from what you love to do. I feel blessed every day because I make money from what I love to do. So try not to compromise too much. If you're compromising to the point where you feel uncomfortable, find another project. And then the other thing is, like Madonna, don't give up. Do not give up. Keep knocking on those doors and keep making that music until you find your niche. Well, thank you for being here. And thank, thank you for you. that. Everybody, Nikki Siano. Thank you. <laughs>